Okay. This is uh, an amazing video uh, testimony of T.V. Barrett when the fire fell and it's about his anointing with the Holy Spirit back in the day. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to avoid the uh, Trying to avoid the, the brightness of the light over there. Uh, but, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's not so bad. Okay, so we're reading from the book When the Fire Fell, an outline of my life by T.V. Barrett. Um, it is written... Imprinted in Norway in Alfon Hansen's Sons, and it was written in Oslo in 1927. And we're going to page 105, which is chapter 9, A Mighty Anointing of the Spirit. We're going to be reading in a few minutes, because this is the testimony of Pentecost, the, by the guy who brought Pentecost both to England and to Norway, or to Norway and then to England. The mighty anointing of the Spirit, 9. An account of this wonderful experience was sent to friends at Los Angeles, whom I have never seen. Home to my wife to be inserted in B. Poston, and other papers to the Christian Advocate, and to Dr. Adna Simpson, all to the honor of God. I evident, evidently thought at first that I had received the full Pentecostal baptism and gave my letters the heading when the fire fell. But as stated at the commandments of the next chapter, this experience was only a glorious introduction to the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire received on the 15th of November 1906. It was a foretaste of the baptism for which I thank God. Compare John 20, 22. Many desired me to reprint the account, and I did so. It surely prepared the way in the minds and hearts of many for still greater things. The inner power given me by this mighty out anointing drove me to relate the account of it to numbers who immediately began to seek their way to the cross for full cleansing in the blood of Jesus and the fire from heaven. Here then is an extract of the account I sent around. New York, October 8th, 1906. Hallelujah! It took place yesterday, Sunday, October the 7th, between 5 and 6 p.m. Praise the Lord, my heart is burning. It seems to me that I am the happiest man in the world. Everything has become new. I am filled with peace and joy and love to God and man. Yes, indeed, the Lord's ways are truly unfathomable. His leadings with me have always been wonderful. And there's always been a cry in my heart. Forward, forward. Ever since my serious illness over 20 years ago, there has been a constraining power in me to go forward. The doctrine of holiness has always been that dearest subject to my heart. And I have fought many a fight for it without really having without having really had the experience myself. Many a time I've thought that I had received the blessing. But on account of not having been faithful, and partly because of fearfulness to testify of the grace I had received, I lost it again. Many a time I have been so filled with the Lord himself, my cup has overflowed. And the time when most souls were saved has been the time when I have been nearest God in faith and prayer. There has been so much discussion on this subject of sanctification, which has only left bitterness in our hearts and instead of holiness. I think I told you in our paper about a wonderful blessing God gave me at Christmas time. I was reading a little about Mr. Moody at the time when he met Mr. Morehouse and how he preached seven times from John 3.16. As I read this, the Lord's presence filled the whole room, 
and my being was filled with his love. Oh, it was glorious, but nothing to be compared with what I have experienced since. <laughs> Woo! After that, I met some of the new theologians who are found in all denominations, and my spirit burned with indignation. I must say the Lord wonderfully undertook concerning the literature which fell into my hands and the lectures to which I listened and strengthened my faith in biblical truth, though it was brought out by them in a philosophical light. I have never studied the center of all, the redemption, as I do now. Never have I rested more securely on the old foundation. Hallelujah. From what I've written, you will understand that all my attempts to raise funds for Hawkinsburgen have hitherto been unsuccessful. During the summer, I did not even have the chance to speak, chance of speaking in the churches, excepting the Norwegian churches. I understood that the dear Lord was after me. I had prayed by the hour for help towards Hawkinsburgen until I became quite dumb and was obliged to lay all down at his feet. Then the Spirit took hold of me in a new way and searched through my whole being. Not for a moment did I doubt that I was a child of God. Had I done so, I should have gone into despair. I had experienced so much of his grace and his love to me that I felt the slightest doubt would have been a sin against the Holy Spirit. Oh, how abominable I was in my own sight and as I saw myself in the light of his holiness. Over and over again, I was humbled to the dust as I saw my own ambition, selfishness, and willfulness. Oh, my Lord, how grieved his spirit must have been. I was now a silent listener. As the Lord prevented me from conducting meetings myself, I went from one place to another, attending meetings and hearing different preachers. And over and over again, my conscience smote me so greatly that I was terrified, but he also comforted me. Praise be his holy name. As I am writing this, my heart is so full that I can hardly continue. But for the glory of God, it must be done. Perhaps some of those who read these lines may in a light be in a light conflict as I was. Beloved friend, Jesus will help you through. As he helped me, doubt not a moment. Reading Finney's experience was a great help to me in those days. I read his biography with my Bible open before me until there was a great cry within me for deliverance. Some articles in Dr. A. Simpson's magazine were a great help to me. But the strange thing was that I knew it all before and had preached it many a time. Yet, yet though I had experienced so much, it all seemed to new to me now. And I had to read it very carefully, line by line, word by word, often with tears an intense prayer on my knees, and often prostrate on the ground. Then I heard about the revival in Los Angeles, about which I wrote. I immediately sent a letter to the friends over there and told them about my conflict. But you know, we never can find words to express the things that lie deepest in our hearts. At a meeting where Mr. Lyle spoke at Dr. Simpson's hall, I asked them to pray for me, that my heart might be filled with the Spirit of God. However, what I first needed was to be cleansed in the blood of Jesus so that I could believe I was purified from all my sins. Oh, my dear friend, if you have been there, you know that this battle may just may be just as hard, possibly more so than when you at first sought the Lord. Sunday, eight years ago, after a long struggle on my knees, I took the Bible to the window and my eyes fell on something there enabling me immediately to grasp full cleansing through the blood of my precious Saviour. This lasted until Tuesday. Then a letter came from Los Angeles. Uh, one minute. Sorry, dear. This lasted until Tuesday. Then a letter came. Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. 
This lasted until Tuesday. Then a letter came from Los Angeles. I will let you have it here. It is a remarkable letter. I read it over and over again. Los Angeles, California, September 28, 1906. T.B. Barrett. Dear brother in our Lord Jesus Christ, greetings to you in his name. Your earnest letter touched our hearts. We are praying the full Pentecostal baptism upon you so that you may be equipped for his service as you never have been. God is on the giving hand, is ready to pour this precious baptism upon you as soon as you are ready to receive it. Oh, there has to be a complete coming out and a leaving all for Jesus, losing sight of all but God, even the things we have done, our own experiences, theories, ideas, even our own thoughts, and just letting God have his own precious way with us. After you have fully, cons after you have fully consecrated and know God has cleansed your heart, then fast and wait upon God. Keep yourself in a receptive attitude and no matter what workings go on in your body, continually let and ask God to have his own way with you. You need to have no fear while you keep under the blood. Perfect love casts out all fear. Sometimes a wonderful shaking takes place and sometimes the language comes at first as a baby learning to talk. But let God have all, tongue, hands, feet, and the whole body presented to him as your reasonable service. When the Holy Ghost comes in, you will know it, for he will be in your very flesh. Be obedient on every line. Be nothing that he may be all in all. We would be so glad if God should lead you to Los Angeles. Many have come from afar and have gone back with their wonderful Pentecost. Hallelujah. We send you a sample copy of the paper and will be rejoiced to hear from you again. I have lived in Los Angeles for about 12 years and very many of my friends, those I have known for years, are getting their Pentecost and are thus ready to meet Jesus when he comes and labor for souls as never in their life until that time shall come or they go home to glory. Oh, praise God forever. When we have this baptism, we are very well, very different from what we ever were before. And we would do nothing to lose it. It fits up. It fits us up for the stake or whatever may come. May God bestow this wonderful baptism upon you most speedily is our earnest prayer. Mrs. I. May Throop. After having received this letter, I made up my mind that I would have the same blessing that is spoken of in Acts 2, 4, and that the friends in Los Angeles have received. I needed it both to live for God and to work for him. Though I really had given up all before I was cleansed, still so many things came back to my memory from my past life that I really felt sad, but I believed that Jesus had purified my heart by faith, Acts 15, 9. The heart-searching prayers that went up to the Lord every day were without any doubt a result of the mighty influence of the Spirit over my mind and my heart. I was to have gone here and there, but I had to give it all up. I also fasted somewhat. The apostles fasted, and, some, and doubtless the first Christians did so too. Acts 13, 2 and 3. Now and then, to have a season of fasting does not weaken the body. It rather strengthens us. As regards Hawkinsborgen, I said to the Lord, if you want this cause to prosper, then it will prosper. Though men and devils oppose, and if you do not want me to have success in this work, then I do not care to have it. I only desire thy will in this matter. This was before the cleansing. God alone knows what a burden then rolled off my heart. I read the word of God over and over again. Oh, how it helped me at this time. Here alone, far away from loved ones and friends, shut up in my room with God only. I do not mention this to make the impression upon anyone that it is necessary to wait so long. There are many in Los Angeles who were saved, purified, and baptized in the Holy Spirit at the same meeting. 
a thought struck me that perhaps when I went back home, I would be persecuted if I preached the full gospel in this way. I've never been timid as far as I know, but the self within us does so like to be glorified and unconsciously it enters into our very best and holiest service for God. But now they can say what they like. My all is on the altar. Reputation, if there was any, it was absolutely undeserved. Glory, energy, time, strength, ability, friends, all my loved ones, with great pain I took them one by one and laid them again, but now fully on the altar. What I was, what I might be, my plans, and God knows they have been many, my desires, my future, God could send me now wherever he liked to the smallest congregation in the country or to the largest, to China, Africa, Iceland, anywhere. He could let me continue the ministry I was in or send me all over Norway, all round about the world. I was his forever. And the dearest and last I let go fully my own life. He was also to have that. Of late years, I have often said that I was not afraid to die, but I wanted to live for the sake of my dear ones, for the church, for the salvation of souls, till I was spent. However, I had to say, Jesus, if thou dost want me to die, have thine own way. The devil tempted me, but I cried out to the Lord and said, even if I am sent to hell, I will cling to the work of redemption. But... It was very soon clear to me that hell was not the proper place for me. I was his, my saviour's, eternally. All this I had experienced when I was pleading with God for a pure heart, and now when seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I went over it all again, but I had the assurance in my soul that all things were settled now. I was taken deep, 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 down, ground to powder. At times I said, Jesus, tell mother and father and Susie, and the others home there what I am doing. And he did so, no doubt. Heaven witnessed my conflict. It was God's spirit that fought with me to get complete victory in my heart and life. Saturday evening, I attended one of the meetings. A preacher from Wales spoke, and I felt it was a greeting from God to me. He spoke about the Holy Spirit and was filled and permeated by it himself. On Sunday, I took part in the Lord's Supper in a little chapel there. Pastor Wilson conducted the service. In Dr. Simpson's alliance work, numbers of all evangelical creeds take part. Wilson was pastor in the Episcopal, Episcopal Church. He had been saved through the Salvation Army, but still used the priestly garb of his church. The organist was a soldier in the Salvation Army and sat there with her uh, uniform. Several other ministers were present. Behind the altar on the wall stood the inscription, Jesus only. <laughs> and thus we melted together in him. After the service, I went upstairs to my room. I was staying at the Alliance house and locked the door and remained there all the day, not even going down to lunch. I felt that something must take place. The blessing must come. I was so hungry. All within me was crying out to God for help. Had I received full light on the subject, I might have entered into the full Pentecostal experience, but I was determined to hold out. My heart cried out in mighty appeals to God. I thought I would keep the battle going, even if I did so in my own strength. This I soon saw was perfectly hopeless. But how often we keep battling, even unconsciously, in our own strength. I had noticed at times on Sunday a remarkable warmth in my breast, but it left me. Whilst weeping Sunday afternoon, a little before 5 p.m., the fire came back to my breast. I hid my face in a towel so as not to disturb the inmates next door, but it did not last long ere I shouted so loudly that they must have heard me afar off. Had it not been for the noise in the street, I was a while bathed in the perspiration. They no doubt shouted aloud in the house of Cornelius, loudly magnified God. Norwegian translation, Acts 10, 46. I could not help it. I was seized by the holy power of God throughout my whole being, and it swept through my whole body as well. Then I remembered the advice given in the letter from Los Angeles concerning the body, but I was not afraid. I was willing to die in order to be sure that this was the work of God. I laid my hand on my pulse. The beat was even as, as even as usual. 
I drank a glass of water, but the storm went on. I then got hold of Brother Lyle, but could scarcely say a word when he came in. Then my whole body shook under the great workings of the Spirit. Some will possibly believe that I was overtaxed after the long struggle. No, I had been resting several weeks without holding meetings. I felt stronger physically than usual. Brother Lyle didn't know what to make of it. When he came in, I was lying stretched over a chair on the floor. He began to pray to the Lord for me, but I stopped him. This is the Lord. Yes, but you know, brother, that the devil attacks people at times, he said. The devil is conquered ere this, my brother. I answered, weeping, but sure of victory. This is the Spirit of God. I had asked the Lord to give me the baptism of the Spirit in such a way that I would always be sure that it was not human feeling merely or the work of men, but the supernatural power that touched me and went through my whole body, soul and spirit. Now I received the assurance that this was God's Spirit. He was filling the empty vessel. Brother Lyle helped me up and asked me to lie down a while on the bed. But the work went on there just as mighty as before. Then he went downstairs and returned after a while in company with Pastor March D. Dean. But then I was sitting on a chair and my whole soul was filled with the wonderful peace of God. They were so delighted when they saw me. We conversed together and thanked God and I went down and took dinner at six o'clock. After that, I went to the meeting. The fire of God was constantly burning within me. I felt as if I was the happiest man in the world. Everything was new, everything. The two men I spoke to went immediately forth to be prayed with and gave their hearts to God. When I related my experience at the meeting, there was great joy. When I was struggling before the anointing came, I thought of many of the dear saints in Norway who many a time had been vexed by my determination to carry out my own will. I made up my mind that I would ask them all to forgive me as soon as I came back. I had often been hasty and ambitious and willful. It almost seemed as if I could manage the devil himself, but God knows how foolish I was. Deep down in my heart, I was really sincere and meant it all right. But my impetuous mind, which was sometimes subdued and under control, breaking out again, may have hurt many a one. I hope soon, I hope soon to see you face to face and then to ask you personally to forgive me. But as my return journey has been postponed for some months, I must ask you to do so anyway. As I am writing and thinking of these things, my tears are flowing and my heart is lifted up in prayer to the Lord. Oh, what victory God gave me. Hallelujah. Thus runs the story of the first mighty outpouring on my soul on the 7th of October, 1906. The letter goes on to say, I could not sleep for some time that night. The Spirit spoke and prayed and rejoiced within me. The following day, I went to see Bishop Burt at the office. Whoever, Wherever I came, I was obliged to tell people what God had done and ask them if they were saved or baptized in the Holy Ghost. Bishops, preachers and people amongst all classes. There was a preacher's meeting that day at the head office and they immediately began to ask me to conduct meetings, although I had not told them of the blessing. And for some time, no one had asked me to preach. A reporter of one of the large papers is waiting for you, they said. What does he want? You have asked him to see, you have asked to see him. No, indeed not, I said with a smile. I have not asked to speak with any reporter. But there he stood. He had heard my lecture about Norway. Well, if you wish to report anything, tell them that the Lord baptized my soul yesterday with the Holy Spirit. He desired to know more about it. And I gave him a testimony at the same time about Jesus. I thought surely that I had received the full Pentecostal baptism, as many do in our day, who have passed through a similar experience. To Bishop Burt, I said, I have packed my trunk and intend to leave for home with the Koronia tomorrow. No, he answered. You must remain here until December. Do the best you can and return home by Christmas. Perhaps the Lord may still have a way especially in connection with the five cents collection in December. You have done what you could, but you must bide the Lord's time. Fifteen bishops have promised to support the collection, 
and I will bring it up once more at the bishop's board. So take the whole thing with perfect ease, trusting the Lord. A minister who had attended the meetings last summer met me yesterday. He rejoiced when he heard about it all. You look 10 years younger, he said, and have received of the anointing that remains, and it will be sure to do so if I constantly rest in Jesus only. Pray for me, dear friend, that it may be so, and that the fire of God may fall on all his servants, upon all his church on earth, and over dear old Norway. At the meeting yesterday, my sister Mary came in. I seldom see her. She was passing through the city and rejoiced and wept for very joy when she heard about all this and saw me. When I met Pastor Trestal, Trelstad, I said, this is not the old Barrett you see now, brother, and related what God had done. The days that passed by after this gracious anointing of the Spirit were a constant revelation to me of the love of God, such as I had never seen or felt before. Everything seemed changed, although I had not as yet entered into the full Pentecostal glory. There was a constant peace within me. At times the Holy Ghost was as a fire within me, reminding me of the indwelling Christ and his wondrous love. I knew that Christ had taken seat in the temple of my heart. My chief desire now was to glorify his holy name. I wrote in my journal, The Spirit warms my heart when I get near anybody. He wants me to speak. All other experiences have been eclipsed by this great demonstration of God's power in my heart. Just after the meeting at which I first testified of the blessing, I went out onto the street and had to speak to two men about it. So far, nobody has been annoyed at the testimony. I went straight to a group of young men on a street corner. Some joked. But the message was respected. I believe, nevertheless, some Hebrew drivers took it pleasantly. One felt no doubt inclined to joke, but his comrade connect corrected him. I asked a young man at a newspaper stand if he was a Christian. No, he answered, and did not intend to be. He was a Hebrew. Do you know the Hebrew of God personally? No, but Christ will reveal him to you, I said. He became very thoughtful when I left him. I met a Catholic priest once on the car. He seemed surprised but interested with my story. Are you a Catholic priest? I asked. Yes, he answered, reaching out his hand somewhat reluctantly to take mine. <laughs> I'm a Protestant minister, I said, and received such a blessing last Sunday. How so? The Lord baptized my soul with the Holy Ghost, and since then I have been so blessed and glad it's bubbling over, so that I'm obliged to tell all that love the Lord about it. We had quite a conversation. He had just started reading his prayer book when I changed seats and spoke to him. I passed by a well-clad gentleman on the street. My heart was burning and I knew I must speak to him. How do you do, sir? Uh, will you permit me to put a, you a question? Are you a Christian? Yes, he was. I told him my story and we walked far down the street together. He was one of the officials of the Reformed Church. Young businessmen, have been so interested to listen to my story. I came across two fine young gentlemen on Broadway one evening and could not pass them by, pass by them. Excuse me, gentlemen, do you love the Lord? They looked at each other, then at me, and said nothing for a few moments. The tallest of the two then looked heavenward, but the other asked, what do you mean? That was my chance to give a short message. I've come across several Catholics and their answers were interesting. One big fellow walking along smoking held on to the point that that what a man had been from his boyhood, he ought to continue to be. He was a Catholic. I had a good chat with him. On passing a stable a little further down the street, I saw several men standing there and passed by. But I had to return and by way of introduction asked if they cared to have a paper presenting the chief person present with a Christian advocate. They were very polite. One of the men was a Dane, a little bit tipsy and a little bit tipsy. Poor fellow. When he heard I was from the Christiana, he said he had been there. That's how I found out he was a Dane and spoke to him in Norwegian. When I attended the first meeting of all New York and New York East and Newark and conferences at the Evangelistic Commission sessions, 
I felt God wanted me to speak to the crowd. But how could I? The problem was fixed, and these programs often shut out the Holy Spirit from the church. There are so many big men to do the work that the Holy Spirit doesn't get a chance. As Bishop Fowler preached, I was relieved somewhat by saying amen now and then. But towards the close, I thought I could have fainted under the pressure of God's Spirit to arise and speak. I remember before this that I felt anxious and almost trembled at the thought of facing the great crowd of American preachers. But now the Lord had filled me with a message of a special nature. Dr. Henderson was about was to speak after the bishop, but before he could get a chance, I was on my feet and shouted, Bishop, Dr. Henderson, will you give me a chance to speak? If you don't, my heart will burst. I then went before them and told them of God's wondrous grace. It was nothing but God's spirit that could have given me the boldness to do that. And I understand the message made a great impression and struck home. One minister said it was the keynote of the meeting. I don't know, but I have I was relieved and praised God for the chance and the grace given me. Dear old Bishop Andrews spoke so beautifully to me after the meeting. And Bishop Fowler likewise, he said something like this. You will be staying on now, I should say. I should say. He meant concerning my intended journey home. He thanked God for me. Praise the Lord. After Dr. Henderson's address by Dr. H, I mean he, Dr. H, invited all the pastors around the altar. There was a great crowd, so that was soon filled as well as the benches around the altar. I could but immediately begin to thank God for his mercy to me. And then the brethren continued in prayer. I threw my arms around one of the brethren nearest to me and told him how blessed it was. Praise him. He answered, ah, I do. My soul is full of it. I bowed down to the floor close by the rich mister who had given me $100 the Saturday before towards Hawkenborgen. He had just given the opening address of the evening. I grasped his hands at the close, and he seemed greatly impressed. Somehow or other, the ice was broken, and there was scarcely anybody in that crowd but went about handshaking all over the church. At the book room, I suppose everybody knows about it now. In the stores and on the car, God works through this poor vessel. Twice I have been constrained to shout out an invitation to Christ on the car. It's a new life, a well of blessing in my soul. <laughs> Sometimes in the night I have been awakened and the Holy Spirit has groaned and prayed within me for those I have spoken to, and I believe they will be saved. At the meetings today, I wept like a child as a song describing the glorious victory of the baptized soul was sung by a married couple. It, was, it just described all my struggle and victory. When I came from the meeting I have just described, I heard a young man walking briskly behind me. And stopping short, I asked him if he was a Christian. No, was the reply. Then he walked together right down to the elevated, where he left me, on the platform of the elevated. I asked the policeman if he was a Christian, gave my message, and stepped into the car, which had just come. But as he was going the same way, he stepped in two, and took a seat by my side, where we conversed together. He was an Irishman. On leaving the elevated, I accosted two gentlemen and gave them a message. And thus the Lord's Spirit has been working. This was the kind of work I cared least of all to do. When I went down to White Star Line Pier to see dear brother Lyle off, the old man at the ticket office on the elevated platform took a strange interest in me as soon as he saw me and gave me his seat the few moments we waited for the train. He was a butcher by profession, but fared badly and had now taken that job. God gave him a message. In the car, I got the conductor to sit by my side and gave him a message. As he rose at the station, another man took his place. He looked stern, but I put the question point blank. Are you a Christian, sir? And he received the message very kindly. I gave him my card, and he wanted to know where I was going to preach as he would look me up. Thus, it had been going on. Wonderful life. I had spoken to people before. Many thought I did too much of it then. There was surely a very deep desire in my heart to bring the people a blessing, but now it springs from the, a deep assurance and a wellspring of love and has much deeper effect. Hallelujah. Praise be God. The journal continues with descriptions of similar scenes. It seemed as if the Lord gave me quite a mission on the streets of New York. 
some of these cases were very remarkable. I received a nice letter from Seymour, Los Angeles, yesterday. But now the victory is won. Hallelujah. Amen. God deepens his work more and more. I did not know, even then, that a still greater blessing was held in store for me. The full baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. Sunday, 14th of October. I attended the missionary meeting at the Gospel Tabernacle in the morning, at which Dr. Simpson preached, and the missionary collection was taken. With the afternoon collection, it amounted to more than $70,000. I reckon Dr. Simpson is to be Dr. Simpson to be one of the greatest preachers of our day. In the evening, I preached at Dr. Burt's church at Brooklyn. He took me to the Epworth League first, in which I took part. There was general surprise at seeing so many present at that service and at the service in the church. God blessed his word wonderfully to many, I believe. The author was filled at the close of the meeting with officials and members seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Monday 15th, I had a good time yesterday, just on the same spot where Jesus met my soul the Sunday before, and at about the same hour. Glory to his name. Amen. The street work continues. Many touching scenes at times, much writing in between. The Lord has helped me out of many financial difficulties also. Bishop Vincent sent me some very interesting letters after receiving the account of my experience. I have them still. He thought that I had always had it. I pointed out as clearly as possible the definite work done by the Holy Spirit now. He wrote many beautiful words, but I asserted nevertheless that I had really received a definite experience, mm -hmm. the like of which I had never, I had not attained before. I had not been clear as to the gifts of the Spirit. I did not expect tongues as a definite sign of the Pentecostal blessing, but the friends at Los Angeles wrote and said, I must press on to get the gift of tongues. In answer to this, I wrote, I am willing to be anything for my blessed Savior. October the 23rd, I am seeking the gift of tongues and the other signs of Pentecostal power. God, in his mercy, will give me. 24th, I have been praying all day, ate no lunch, but intensely sought the gifts, renewing my vows, praying and praising God, consecrating anew. Although I knew no special hindrance, all belonged to Jesus. I have studied the matter again, I have felt the fire burn within often but I'm expecting a renewal of the baptism in conjunction with the gift of tongues and other gifts the Lord may send. It surprises me that I have to look so long in vain as it seems, but God has his reason, of course. Oh, may the seal of the Pentecostal power soon be given me. 25th, I have rested well. I enjoyed perfect peace. I know it was the great anointing on the 7th of October, but I want the finished work in one sense never finished on earth. But the Pentecostal testimony, or the seal, gift of tongues, to the power, and still more power, in looking back on my life and in passing through in my mind's eye what Christ has done and is doing for me, I cannot but praise him. Just fancy, it's a year today since I first saw America. What a marvelous year it has been. One thirty, Still seeking the gift, but oh, what a glorious time I had with the Lord this morning. His very presence was here. The holy fire was burning in my soul, filling me with joy as a cup running over and glad hallelujahs. Glory to his name. Amen. Heard Gypsy Smith last night at Grace M.E. Church. It was a most deeply spiritual meeting. When God gave him great power, I heard him in Hull, England, deliver his famous lecture from Gypsy Tent to Platform. He remembered when we shook hands. I did not get the gift of tongues yesterday, nor have I received it yet today. But God is blessing me wonderfully. Praise be his holy name. I have written to Los Angeles for an answer to some questions. Former letters told of persecution, even from the Methodists. But I was told that the Holy Ghost only comes in when you come to an end of yourself. I have these letters. The printed heading of each letter ran thus. The Apostolic Faith Movement. Charles F. Parham, Projector, W. J. Seymour, Pastor, 312 Azusa Street, Los Angeles, California. This letter was signed by G. A. Cook, man, dot, ed. They were delighted to hear of my experience. I quote a few lines from, of a letter. As I read your letter, 
I could feel the spirit moving in me, thrilling me with joy and witnessing to the great work that had been done in your heart. May the Lord keep you in that state of grace and deep humility that you now enjoy. I told about your baptism before the meeting yesterday and great joy was manifesting. The speaking in tongues should follow the baptism. If you had remained under the power until, until the Lord had finished, you undoubtedly would have spoken in tongues, not necessarily for use in a foreign field, but as a sign to you of Pentecost, the same as at the house of Cornelius and at Ephesus. Some go several days after the baptism before speaking, but unless you do speak, there is always a tendency to leak out, a leak hole for the devil to tempt you. While we are getting a Bible experience, we may as well go all the way with Jesus and measure up in every particular. Many here have taken the stand that speaking in tongues was not necessary, and after being highly anointed have claimed their Pentecost. But their power was limited, and nearly all have seen their error and tarried until they speak in tongues. May the Lord bless you and use you. I also received a letter dated November 2nd. Your letter of October 26th at hand, we are joyed to learn that God is doing so much for you. Satan is not converted and is, not, is still in the business of perplexing God's people. He is very wise and cunning and has many tricks to use that you nor I have not learned of. You must keep your eyes on Jesus and doubt not that God has begun a work that he is able and willing to finish. God has many lessons of humility and patience to teach us by withholding gifts and blessings that we seem to think should be always forthcoming. The more earnestly we cover a gift from God, the more we sacrifice to obtain it, the more highly we will prize it when it is obtained. These letters had a great influence on my mind. I understood that there was a lack in my experience, but knew that God was willing to satisfy my every want. As I look back on those days of prayer and earnest pleading before the Lord, I understand that the Holy Spirit was teaching me great truths, little by little, but I had not received any teaching concerning the tongues as a special sign of Pentecost before in the circles where I had hitherto been. 13th of November, I received the best news from home. My dear wife writes, the work at home has begun to blaze and God is giving a revival of grace as never before. 14th of November, I had a glorious evening all along with Jesus last night. Oh, how sweet the divine fellowship. Glory! On the 15th of November, I was seen to the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire, accompanied with tongues as the disciples on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Oh, what a glorious and wondrous experience. Precious Savior, how shall I ever be able to thank thee enough for thy care and mercy? Blessed be thy everlasting name. Amen. Chapter 10. When the fire fell, baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. An account of this experience on the 15th of November was sent to Norway to be inserted in Buposten and other papers the day the, after the fire fell. They had received the description of the former experience on the 7th of October, and now I felt that my friends ought to know the outcome of it all. I did not speak in tongues on the 7th of October, and it, as it will be seen, I had never seen anybody receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. This mighty experience that was sought for and received by all in the first Christian church, Acts 19, 2, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, seemed to be quite unknown in the Christian churches of our day. When I accept some persons of whom I had read and heard, and very few, even of them, ever spoke in tongues or wrote about them. In Acts, you find tongues mentioned in connection with the three of the great outpourings of the Spirit related there, and in the other two cases, you are given to understand that they were no exception to the general rule. But I had never seen the fire form and knew very little about the tongues before the news about God's mighty work in Los Angeles reached me. Had I received sufficient teaching as to this important truth, I might have, as Brother Cook said in his letter, have gone through with the Lord until the tongues came on the 7th of October. How strange that all these things should be so unknown to us what a responsibility rests with the church that has laid aside the great blessing in lukewarmness and unbelief. The Lord showed me, nevertheless, through this break in my experience, that it's possible to receive great anointings of the Spirit without speaking in tongues, but that if we receive the full Pentecostal baptism, as they at the beginning, it will be a greater infilling, accompanied with tongues, prophetic languages, Acts 19.6, loud praises, Acts 10.46. 
in the Norwegian version, highly prisudut. That is, praising God loudly, but especially tongues, which was to be the special sign of the new dispensation, all the other signs having been found among the leaders before Pentecost, Mark 16, 16. I wrote, therefore, in my account home that it appears to me that when I spoke in tongues, it was in connection with a power which was far beyond all that I had experienced before, that my former experience was a glorious introduction to the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire, which I received on the 15th of November, 1906. I possibly made a mistake on the 7th of October and disturbed the workings of the Spirit by expecting help from others. At any rate, I had to wait more than a month before the power was turned on again, as it were, in an ever-increasing degree until I burst forth in tongues and loudly magnified God <coughs> in the power of the Holy Spirit. This time nothing interfered with the workings of the Divine Spirit, and as a result the same outward sign of the Spirit's presence was seen and heard as on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. I learned also that the change wrought in our lives by the Holy Spirit, when we become the children of God regenerated, was a different experience to the baptism in the Holy Ghost, when he fills us and immerses us into his own being, body, soul, and spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. My description of the baptisms was as follows. Or the baptism was as follows. Many will be astonished and skeptical as to what I am now writing, but others will rejoice, I am sure, and many will seek this blessing. I waited about a week after having received the mighty anointing on the 7th of October, still looking for the manifestation of tongues, but nothing happened. Then I wrote again to Los Angeles and in order to know, if possible, the reason why it did not come. They asked me only to tarry before the Lord in prayer, and he himself would guide me. One day I spent 12 hours before the Lord to find his mind in the matter. Oh, how glorious it was, here in the quietness alone with the Lord to tarry before him. How many things the Lord taught me then, and, I, and shed new light on my spirit. How precious his word became, days and hours never to be forgotten. Over and over again, the enemy tempted me with the thought that the manifestation of tongues was not for me. Once the presence of the devil was so near to me that I shook my fist at him in the name of the Lord, though I did not see him, the reason why it took such a time was because I doubted whether I could receive the tongue and thought of such strange things taking place that I should suddenly speak in an unknown tongue. This alone was sufficient to hinder the work of the Spirit in me. As some special manifestation in my jaws and tongue took place, my faith was strengthened little by little to believe that the speaking in tongues would soon be given me that it was already my privilege only that I had to wait for the Lord's time when his full power would possess me. However, the Lord did not mean this to take place in a corner. Wednesday evening, I had to tell those who sat beside me at table, Christian friends, that I sought this blessing and would surely get it. Immediately, a remarkable sensation passed through my whole body. I heard the doctor's wife had arrived from Los Angeles who had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the gift of tongues. I called on her. I put my case before her and asked her to lay hands on me and pray for me. Immediately I had the same feeling in my speaking organs, only stronger than before. She sent me to a friend of hers who conducted meetings in New York. She had recently received her baptism in Canada, according to Acts 2.4. I went to the meeting and surely if I had been as I was before, I would not have stayed but gone home again. You may be sure when the power of God falls upon people, all traditions and rules will not be followed exactly. Here was a movement and life which would not have fitted in with high mass in a cathedral, but it would not hurt the cathedral, nor those who attend the services there. If this light and life should break in on them. The next morning I came again and we had a wonderful prayer meeting, and I attended the evening meeting also. When I think of it now, it seems strange to me that the Lord should take me to such a place of no reputation to give me the greatest blessing that I have ever received in my life. <laughs> it may be beneficial for some to know this, that I had to stop asking for tongues. The cry which now was within me was to receive the full Pentecostal baptism as the Christians of the early church received it. I especially mean 
accompanied by tongues, if not the gift of tongues that remained, but as in 10, Acts 10, 46. I was now prepared for the outward evidences of the power and not at all anxious, as many have been, because they did not know what it was and have therefore withstood the power of the Holy Spirit. There were not many people at the evening meeting, but God's power was mightily manifested. I asked the leader of the meeting a little before 12 o'clock to lay hands on me and pray for me. Immediately the power of God began to work in my body, as well as in my spirit. I was like Daniel, powerless under the divine touch, Daniel 10.8, and had to lean up on the, upon the table on the platform where I was sitting and slid down to the floor. Again, my speaking organs began to move, but there was no voice to be heard. I asked a brother, a Norwegian, who had often heard me preach in Christiana, and the doctor's wife to pray for me once more. Try to speak, the Norwegian said. But I answered that if the Lord could speak through the human, a human being, he must make me do so by his spirit. There was to be no humbug about this. When they were praying, the doctor's wife saw a crown of fire over my head, a cloven tongue as of fire in front of the crown. Compare Acts 2, 3 to 4. The brother from Norway and others saw this supernatural, highly red light. <laughs> the very same moment my being was filled with light and an indes and, and indescribable power, and I began to speak in a foreign language as loudly as I could. For a long time I was lying upon my back on the floor speaking. Afterwards I was moving about on my knees with my eyes shut. For some time this went on, then at last I sat on a chair, and the whole time I spoke in diverse kinds of tongues, 1 Corinthians 12, 10, with a short interval between. When speaking some of these languages, there was an aching in my vocal cords. I am sure that I spoke seven or eight different languages. They were clear and plain, and the different positions of the tongue, and the different tones of the voice, and the different accents made me understand how different the language were, one from the other. Now, while I am writing this, the spirit works on my vocal cords and I have to sing. The most beautiful of all was singing, was the, was the singing. When the inspiration reached its climax, I burst out in a wonderful baritone solo. I never heard the tune before and did not understand the words, but it was the most beautiful language, so smooth and easy to pronounce. Those who were present heard the whole thing and said that my voice was quite changed. I shall never forget how beautiful and pure the singing sounded. It seemed to me the rhythm in the verses and chorus was as perfect as it is possible to be. Several times after that I sang songs, and today the Spirit has been constantly singing through me in a foreign language. I have recited poem after poem that were given me instantaneously by the Spirit. <laughs> now I am asking the Lord to give me the interpretation of the languages I speak. This lasted till about 4 o'clock in the morning. There were nine persons present until 3 a.m. 3 a.m. Who can testify to the truth of every word I've written? Some of them stayed until 4 a.m. Once a great concern came over me, not for myself, but for the others. My voice grew stronger and stronger. I rose up and spoke with burning zeal till I felt the victory was won. It was a surely a serious message that the Spirit gave me that moment. In that way, I could sometimes speak in a strange language, and my voice grew stronger and stronger under this mighty power until thousands of people could have heard me. This was no doubt the prophetic gift. Oh, hallelujah. Then the spirit of prayer came upon me when Norway and my loved ones and my friends at home were laid so heavily on me that I cried aloud under the pressure. Then all Scandinavia, the whole of Europe, New York, and America were laid on my heart in the same way. Surely I have never prayed like that before. It was the Spirit himself who prayed through me and made intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Sometimes I burst out in thanks to God for his marvelous grace towards me. Prostrate on the floor, I rejoiced and praised my Savior for his love. Sometimes it seemed as if the veil was so thin I could almost expect to see the heavens open over me. Glory, glory, glory. Oh, that I have, I, oh, that I, unworthy as I am, should experience anything like this. Those few moments, except when that serious message was given, my mind was restful and satisfied. Such waves of God's love swept over me that I wept and sang in the spirit. Oh, Sometimes I have felt as if I were strong enough to cast mountains into the sea. Now I understand the secret, how Samson and David got their strength 
At four o'clock in the morning, I went to rest and slept as sweetly as a little child. I have related this marvelous work of grace to several, several already, rested a little this afternoon, and then I took my gymnastics that I generally take every morning. I am happy and rejoicing in the Lord as never before. That was the testimony of T.B. Barrett, who brought Pentecost to Norway and then to Sunderland, England, even to the place where Smith Wigglesworth later got the baptism.